Have you ever experienced something so crippling in your life that has made you feel broken? I have. Are you someone who has a giving heart but is struggling to feel good themselves? Are you consistently putting your needs aside to take care of everyone else? If so, you're not alone. Giving starts with giving to yourself so that you are able to give of yourself to other people. Isn't it time you took back control and discovered what makes you tick? Join me in my journey and find out how you can feel better about yourself, live your best life, and share that with others. Thinking of yourself, it doesn't make you selfish. It makes you brave. I'm Nelia, and this is the Giving Starts With You podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Giving Starts With You podcast. I'm your host, Nelia Hutt. Thank you again for joining us today for a very, um, what I know is going to be a very important conversation, something that really needs to be discussed. Today we have Lori Singer with us. Welcome, Lori. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thanks for accepting the invitation. This is amazing. So I'm just going to let you know a little bit about Lori. So Lori Singer is a licensed psychotherapist and board certified behavior analyst who heads the successful Lori Singer Behavioral Services in Camarillo, California. Over the last 20 years, she and her team have used an uncommon integrated behavioral and cognitive therapy strategy to help those facing a wide variety of mental health issues. She has also released her first book, You're Not Crazy, Living with Anxiety, Obsessions, and Fed... Fed I can't say that word. <laughs> oh, fetishes, which brings readers into the therapy room and provides a workbook to help individuals serve as their own therapist. I also have to tell you that Lori is also an accomplished endurance athlete, which is amazing. She was a recent inductee into the Ventura Sports Hall of Fame and has competed in more than 100 marathons, many ultra marathons, and Ironman triathlons. This is amazing. Incredible. Thank you, Lori, for coming on the show. Nice to meet you and connect with you today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, um, you know, anxieties and steps to recognize and to overcome them and just um yeah we're just going to talk and hopefully you know one of the one of the missions I always have with this podcast is that we help people not feel that they're alone in whatever it is that they're going through um one of the biggest um things that I love, want to do is end loneliness for people so I'm hoping that these conversations can make someone feel a little bit more accepted, feel a little bit more that there are many people in the world um, suffering with these things. And I'm one of them. And uh, yeah, so Lori, tell us a little bit about yourself. And then we'll, we'll go into, you know, what is behavioral and cognitive therapy anyway, for those that don't know? Well, um, I, uh, Tell me about, I, I've been practicing for many, many years. Uh, I set goals for myself, as you can tell, I'm kind of goal oriented. And the reason why I wrote that book, the book, You're Not Crazy, is because what I had been doing for so many years really works. I, I was, you know, I'm getting um, referrals from pediatricians, from uh, dermatologists, from psychiatrists, because they know that this works. And they had said to me, Lori, you should really write a book. And then people can use the tools from the book and apply them themselves if they can't get to you. And so that's what I did. And when you were talking about anxiety, anxiety takes on many forms. And typically it's, there's another diagnosis that goes with it, like depression or you know skin picking, any of those obsessive compulsive behaviors becomes it makes a person anxious. And that's why they engage in the isolation if it's social anxiety or the phobias, whatever they're diagnosed with, it's anxiety ridden typically. Mm -hmm. And that's what, when people come to me, they're stuck. They can't move forward with their life. And so my goal is to help them figure out a way 
to move forward. We talk about the past, but we don't dwell on the past because of course the past got you to where you are right now, but okay, let's talk about it and then move on. Figure out a way for you to move on with your life because that's what people want to do. They want to get rid of what's stopping them and move forward. And, and a lot of times people don't realize that they do have control over their thoughts. So once we're able to put a plan together, and, and by the way, that's what sets me apart from the other therapists as well. When you come in to see me, you're going to be, we're going to be working. It's not just, we talk, have our session, you leave, you come back the next week. I give you um, data sheets to fill out. From those data sheets, I write an individualized treatment plan in a binder, and I make you accountable for following through with what's ever in that binder, whatever it is, and then you come back to me. So you will have something tangible to take with you. So if you ever do fall back a little bit, you know, because once we feel comfortable and we're not having that anxiety, something might trigger it. Maybe you see a certain person or you watch a movie and you start to feel anxious again. Go back to the strategies that helped you in the first place. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, you need that because when you're when you're in that moment of anxiety, you don't know what to do. So having the workbook, having somebody holding you accountable, it really, you know, it spells it out for you and it makes it so much easier in that moment because you can't think clearly sometimes when you're when you're in that moment. So I appreciate that very much. I think that's great. Um, did you get involved with this um, to start off through a personal journey of yours or how did you get involved in uh and what it is and all the help you're doing today. It's it's funny because I didn't plan on this. You know, this was although I don't really plan much because <laughs> I'm, you know, my personality, my personality is, well, that sounds good. I'll do that. You know, <laughs> hey, let me do this. Uh, but the reason why I went back to school was because, well, there's a couple of reasons. One of one was because of my son's death. Uh, while we were in the hospital, I saw so many families suffer in there. They didn't have a good social support group. Like I was very close to my husband's family because I, I was very close to my dad, but my mom left when we were young. And so um, I saw other families and how a child's illness can just rip a family apart. And I, and I felt, I felt, you know, terrible for those families. And so once I got out, uh, once he passed away, then um, I was just kind of going through the motions of life and the, uh, the cross country coach for the junior college was scouting different runners. And he asked me to come and run at the college. And I was very nervous about that because uh, I was never diagnosed with a learning disability, but I'm sure I have one. And I have ADHD, which I wasn't diagnosed until I was in my fifties. Um, so I was a horrible student. I barely graduated high school. So I was scared to go to college, uh, but I did it. I went to college and what I did was I applied the same principles for training for a race to studying. I got out my schedule. I wrote everything down and I ended up graduating valedictorian of the junior college and going on to get these degrees and having my own business. So it's just interesting the way that life works out, isn't it? I mean, it's so strange. You can't really put your finger on it. But I knew I wanted to help families. I, in some way, I wanted to help. I didn't know that I would help individuals with developmental disabilities, um, but I love working with that population. So I work with neurotypical individuals any age. My youngest client right now is three, year old, three years old, and I have three clients in their 70s. Mm. And they're um, the ones that are in their 70s, they're anxiety based, but they're skin picking and, you know, OCD behavior. They're doing great. Unbelievable. It's so exciting. I still get excited. <laughs> it's so great. You know, even like the hair pulling, I know some it, it's more teenage, uh, teenage age, I find I don't know if that's more typical at that age or not. But I find like hair pulling or just, you know, there's so many things when people think of anxiety, they think of one type of thing, like if you've never experienced before, you think of this nervous person walking around without yes. you know any direction. And that's so not what it is. You know, no, I have a client right now, as a matter of fact, who is 15 years old and his mom didn't even know he had anxiety. He would ha have these tantrums and stay in his room. And his, when 
when he took the data and then I reviewed it with the family, his mom started crying because she said, I had no idea. He held everything in. So you're right. Some people talk a lot. They move around where others shut down. And so everybody experiences it differently. Uh, it could be the hair pulling. It could be skin picking. It could be self-injurious behavior as far as cutting, picking. I mean, anything. It's, that's why I think almost everything is anxiety based. It's our behavior is based on how we perceive a certain situation is going to play out. Should we do this? Yes or no. We overthink it. Mm -hmm. um, so it just, it is, it's interesting. And another thing, there's a, a, there's six case studies in my book. And one of them is it's conversion disorder. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever heard of that? Yes, I have. So I have two clients and there's not many individuals with conversion disorder, but I've had two, my entire years of practicing over 20 years. And one of them is in the book. And that is just an amazing story. This individual was, when I first met them, they were in a wheelchair and they couldn't walk. They really could walk, but they thought they couldn't walk. And it's just so interesting the way that their mind really talked them into something that they thought they couldn't do. And then, then they had a walker, then they had a cane. But that individual reached out to me last month just to let me know that they had finished their first semester of college. Oh, what a great, oh. what a great email to get. I, I don't always get those emails. Usually it's a crisis situation. <laughs> oh. oh, that's so fantastic. Because this learning how to manage and recognize even that you have it for some people, they don't even know. They know that there's something wrong, but they don't know what it is. It's life changing. It's life altering. It is. In my case, it was people thought I was fine, just like that teenager, um, because I wasn't walking around all nervous. I was just stone faced holding everything in, you know, and for people who hold things in, I find these things happen in your body and you're like, what is going on? I feel like I'm having a heart attack. I feel like I'm dying. Why can't I breathe? Why am I feel like I'm choking? And then that's when you're like, okay, there's something wrong. So sometimes it appears in so many different ways. So thank you for mentioning that. And sometimes I will get people who have already gone to the hospital several times mm -hmm. and they're, they're telling them, the doctors are saying, look, there's nothing physically wrong with you. You need behavioral therapy. And so, but I use the combination both. And then I have dermatologists in the area where there's so many skin pickers out there. Mm. It's amazing because they can hide it too. Some of them hide it, some of them don't. They hide it underneath their you know, sleeves or on their legs or the back of their neck, uh, but they do serious, serious damage to their skin and it can get infected and that it just takes on a whole new. They really think that there's something wrong with their skin, but then once they start to take the data and we start to talk about it, they realize that it's usually under a stressful situation that it's occurring, but then also it becomes habit forming. So we have to teach them a new replacement behavior and an incompatible behavior. What can we come up with where you can't pick your skin? So in essence, that's sort of what behavioral therapy is, like for all of us who haven't heard the term before. So it's changing one behavior for another. So you come and you together, you guys, um, will or you'll suggest or together you'll come up with the best way for them? Um, typically, I, I write everything out. And the behavior part of it is um, we use visuals, anecdotal stimuli to remind you to, you know, to, to use your replacement behavior, whatever that is. Uh, for skin picking, it could be the boat key change. You have to keep your hands busy because if your hands are busy, you can't scratch and pick, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so the behavior part of it is how do we change your the environment to help you change your behavior? For example, what if we had somebody who just wanted to stop smoking? And so what I've done in the past is I made <laughs> printed out pictures of people that have to talk with a trach or mm -hmm. somebody's lungs that are black. And then we put those around the house or wherever 
mm-hmm. this individual is typically going to smoke. And um, so that is a behavioral part. We're changing the environment to help that person change their behavior. And then also what I put together is called a motivational story. And that's actually in my book too. Uh, it, it's very easy to use from the book. And it talks about how, you know, uh, your diagnosis doesn't define who you are. Mm -hmm. You're a good person. You're just stuck. And we're going to help you move forward. So, you know, and it, thank you. And it's so, and it's almost like, it's just like an affirmation and you read it in the morning. So then, you know, I can change my behavior. I know I can do this. Mm -hmm. I have people that love me and care about me and want to help me. I'm doing something to move forward with my life. And the next time that I feel like I'm getting anxious or I might engage in the, whatever the maladaptive behavior is, I'm going to stop, stop my negative thoughts or whatever I'm doing. I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to make a healthy choice and I'm going to take a deep breath. Mm. So it's all based on that signal, red, yellow, green as well. Yes. I love that so much. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that we are not our depressed selves. You know, it's, it's something we deal with, but it's not who we are or anxiety or any of those things, because that creates a new problem. Then we're having self doubt. We're starting to have self hate. We're, we're not helping ourselves by thinking that, you know, like identifying ourselves as being, that is everything we are. And I think it's so important to know the difference. Um, When you don't know the difference, it really, it can, it's so hurtful. You know, I know this personally, and that's why I'm saying, I think it's great that you talk about in your book, how to differentiate and how to separate those two things. It is important because especially, you know, the kids that come to see me, even the young adults, you know, they've been told by their parents and it's not on purpose. So actually I do a lot of times I will write a separate plan just for the parents to follow. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what you need to do your role because you're enabling this behavior um, and you're creating more anxiety for this individual that needs to be done. And the parents will thank me because they don't realize what they're doing. Then some feel horrible and I, you know, and I feel bad, but I have to tell them, I don't feel bad because now you're going to learn something new and you're going to help you, you know, you're going to help your child. Uh, But a lot of them don't realize, and they, they didn't know what to do. So having somebody write them a plan of Mm. how do you respond now when they're, when you see them this way, or how can you be a, 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 a part of this plan in a positive way? It gives them something to do and hope. That's so helpful because you want to help your child. And you think you're doing all the right things and you're making it worse, right? And if you don't deal with anxiety yourself, you have no idea. Like if you weren't able to pick up on it before, like then you don't have the strategies in place. And it's hard, but you can't change what you don't acknowledge, right? So even though it's hard for the parents, I'm sure they're relieved after they accept the fact that, okay, I need to do this. I'm sure they're relieved that you have this road work, like this, this roadmap. They are very, very thankful, but it's interesting too, because the one individual, the 15 year old who has a social anxiety, um, he, (laughs) I said to the mom, uh, let me talk to his teacher at school. And um, because he goes to a different type of school where just one teacher that's uh, in, it's not the typical high school setting. And, I'd like to tell her what we're doing, if it's okay with you and it's okay with your son, I'd like her to be a part because he needs to learn how to self-advocate. Mm. We need to teach him, he's, he's getting older and you can't have you always calling the teacher, emailing and taking care of things. And she said, well, uh, I'll call him Johnny. Well, Johnny, you just need to go up to the teacher and tell her this and tell her that. And I could see him just like, <gasps> like take a deep breath. And I said, no, 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 he's not gonna do that. We're not going to ask him to do that. We're going to start with the teacher checking in with him. And then he can, because, Mm. yeah, so she didn't get it that her even asking him to talk to the teacher in that way was so anxiety provoking. Um, Mm. So for me to to be that mediator and say, no, we're not starting with that. This is how we're going to start. And the teacher 
was so receptive and on board. And he's already starting to email her with questions. So it's exciting. It's so great. So great. Because it can really change not just their marks, but the way they feel about themselves and how, like you're saying, how you're going to advocate, like, what are you going to do in three years? You know, what are you going to do in four years? Exactly. You're going to have a boss. You're going to have, yeah, it can really hold you back when you don't have those skills for the rest of their lives. Right. So important. Exactly. Do you find there's, there's a lot more younger people that you're dealing with through this COVID pandemic and virtual school and, do you find the anxiety is just like off the charts? It's horrible. Mm-hmm. It's horrible. And um, I've had more younger kids come in that are exhibiting those, you know, maladaptive behaviors, whatever that is, whatever that looks like for them. It could be tantrum behavior because they're so frustrated and anxious that they don't want to do anything else other than sit in their room or the social isolation. They might just be scared from the parents talking about, or them, maybe they're watching the news, which they shouldn't, <laughs> but, and, and talking about all these negative things. And so they're scared, mm-hmm. which just throws mo- more fuel in the fire. Uh, I've had more younger children with suicidal ideation. I've had the um, teens that have more, um, body dysmorphic disorder because they're spending so much time taking selfies and they want the approval from the social media and their friends. So they get this distorted idea of what their body looks like and what they think more in more teenagers getting plastic surgery now because they're, there's a bump in my nose or there, this isn't right, or I need to change this. And it's, it's sad really. Um, try to get them so they're not spending so much time on social media and yeah and get out there and more play. time with people yeah i hope that things change quickly in this world with this pandemic because i really think um it's it, so many people are suffering in their own groups of their own ages in different ways you know i find that and they don't re- yeah and i was gonna say they don't realize it i have a friend who's in her 60s you know mid 60s this pandemic really hasn't affected her. So she's not even in tune to what's happening with these kids, with the grade school, junior high, high school. And even I have clients who are just graduating college who are now, they're like, now what do I do? Mm. I mean, they thought they were gonna get out of college and things were gonna go, the pandemic was gonna be over. They could get back with their social life, get a job. No, that's not happening. So now they're dealing with that and uh, getting them to try and focus on the positive is what I try to do. And it does help. Let's get some organization, some executive functioning skills together for you so you can put things in order and let's take it step by step, not say this is where I want to be now, but where can you be in a week from now? Where can you be in two weeks from now? Um, I also have this worksheet that I use with clients that I really like and it's thought versus reality worksheets Mm. and because a lot of times what is the thought that you're having what is your opinion and what is really the reality of the situation Uh, for example you know we can go back to the 15 year old because I just did that with him the other day it was he didn't want to talk to his teacher he was scared very scared and so he wrote down what was the thought was I don't want to talk to my teacher And what was his opinion? I shouldn't have to talk to her. My mom can email her. And then what is the reality? He wrote wrote all this himself. I was so proud of him. The reality was she's there to help me. Everything will be fine. Mm. So do you see how that just gets so distorted? Mm. And if they can work through it on paper, it's like journaling, but a little more structured. And you go like, do you um, get to what is it about? connecting with the teacher that makes them afraid like do you go that like do you go more deep into find out why or does it really matter when you're talking it doesn't matter it doesn't I I, to me it doesn't matter because she's a very nice lady you know and it's not just her you see what happens is the anxiety Mm -hmm. and that social phobia if you will it starts to carry over into every environment so he's feeling this when he's with his friends and if they go somewhere where he doesn't know other people, 
introduced to somebody new in a new environment, he has that social phobia mm. and, and, or anxiety. And uh, then it carries over to school. It becomes a problem because it starts to take over your life. Mm. And then you become more and more isolated. And that's what happened with him. He wouldn't even leave his room because he was so afraid he was going shopping in a store. He wouldn't even, and this is where his mom said, I had no, I had no idea because he would go with me. But now that I think about it, he would stand right next to me, put his hands in his pocket, his hood over his head and not say anything. And he said that his heart was just coming through his chest the entire time. Mm -hmm. So, I'm so uh, glad that he's going to enjoy life. Help. Yeah, I'm so glad that uh, you're able to help him. And the reason why I was asking you about that is um, you're a professional <laughs> in this field. And I was just curious if it was just um, if it was common that people who get diagnosed with anxiety want to find out why. Because I know for me, when I first got diagnosed, my big thing was why? Why am I thinking this way? Why is this? You know, and I was told it doesn't matter why. Let's just, you know, recognize it and move on. Don't ignore it. It doesn't matter why. Like, this is the way you think. And this is what we should do to change it. Or together we can work on this. Because I was, it was making me more upset asking right. why, why, why. But I need to know why. In order to stop it, I need to know why. So I was putting myself more in this loop of anxiety even more, right? Yes. And um, I, it's interesting because what I will do is get a history of the problem behavior. Can you tell me when did this first start? And usually once we go down that timeline of what happened, and then you'll, you might say, oh, well, wait a second, you know, now come to think of it. When my dad was really sick, I started to something happen. I don't know what it is. So we can, we can, pretty much pinpoint it, but the problem with anxiety uh, is that it takes on a life of its own. So it may have started with one incident and then it takes over your whole life. So not just, not just that one incident is the anxiety provoking thing for you anymore. Now it's other things because what if, it's the what ifs. Like you said, what if I lose my job? What if I end, end, end up hope, you know, homeless? So I always say, it's the what ifs that create that anxiety. Yeah. Um, Crazy. Yeah. Before we hit record, we were talking and we were talking about this scenario, you know, that if, if I did poorly on a project, my mind would automatically go to, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to become homeless. Like people with anxiety go directly into that, you know, so that's when you break it down, the thoughts versus what's really like, what's reality, right? Exactly. And, and to stop those what if statements, it's just, and it's really interesting to me that the clients that come in to see me, you know, it's been over, over, well over a hundred people, I'm sure over 20 years and still the same mm. seed is planted. Isn't that amazing? Like what if mm -hmm. it's the same two words, what if that creates anxiety in almost everybody amazing when you think about it <laughs> i know if we think of examples like just the example we were talking about right now it's like uh no if you do poorly on one thing it doesn't mean you're going to become homeless like you just skipped like all these big steps right what if it just meant that you could get a different job right it's yeah, yeah. it's so helpful for people to understand that i'm so glad we're talking about this because and unless you know or you change your thinking, it's hurtful. It's hard to deal with anxiety. For the people who are listening that are having panic attacks, that are, you know, feel like they're having a heart attack, that, you know, all these breathing, you feel, you just, you feel so different. So you feel displaced. You feel alone in your pain and everything. It's so important that you understand, you know, and that you go and seek help, like with people like Lori, because it's so, it will change your life. You don't have to. I think that... I Mm -hmm. I think you touched on something extremely important because a lot of people that come to see me, they do feel alone. And it's important that they know you're not alone. There are other individuals more, <laughs> more so now than ever that are experiencing what you're experiencing. 
and to give them hope. The whole thing is to give people hope. You have to give them hope that you will move forward. You need to trust me and we'll work together as a team to help you get out of this place where you're stuck. Um, there was something I was gonna say and I, I can't remember what it is. That's okay. <laughs> But it's true, you feel there, there can't be any movement. You know, you just, like, I know, like you, people who are anxious might feel, um, like you said, alone. They might feel just angry. Why me? They, there's so many things that you go through. And well, I was just gonna say, I just remembered what it was, is that yes. when you feel this way, you think you're so different from everybody else. And a lot of the teens that come to see me, especially, they say, am I your worst case? They want to know, am I, am I your worst case? Like, how bad am I? Mm. And so I tell them, <laughs> you, <are not> my... <laughs> you can read my book, you'll see some of the worst cases, but they were able to come through the other side, actually, you know, they followed the plan awesome. and they were able to come through. Yeah, it's definitely, and some need medication. I'm not going to deny that. Some people to jumpstart, yes. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, you know, sometimes when I see them and they're so distraught and in a, such a bad place, I say, you know, you might want to consider medication. Some are very adamant. No, I'm not going to go on medication. I'm not going to do this. And then I say to them, we can try it, but I want to let you know, I could write you the best behavioral plan in the world. And if you're at a place where you're so depressed or you're so anxiety ridden, you're not going to be able to utilize any of it. So absolutely, that's, that's a reality. Yeah, I think another way to think of it, too, is I know um, sometimes the people with chronic pain, I think, um, you know, the doctors will tell them go to physio, you know, exercise. They're like, well, I can't exercise because I'm in pain. So it's like a circle. Right. But then if they just get maybe an injection to numb the pain just long enough for them to be able to do the exercises, then they kind of get out of that, right? So it's sort of like, sometimes I find, it, it, again, I can only speak about my personal experience. So for me, I did have to go on medication. I was one of those people, I, you know, not going to do it, not going to do it. But it wasn't until I started that and the calmness came that I was open. I was less fidgety right. less to open to all of these other things because sometimes you just can't focus on that stuff so it, yeah so sometimes people do need that and and don't be don't think of yourself as less you know less than if you do just do what you need to do you know be kind to yourself I think that's that's really good advice because that's what I try to tell my um you know my clients is <laughs> you're not going to be able to utilize anything you can't take, you're not going to be able to use any of the suggestions or treatment plan or whatever it is that we have in place because you're just not calm enough to use it. And, and, you know, and it may be that you're on medication the rest of your life, or maybe that they lower the dose, or it may be that you were able to wean yourself off. I don't really know, but as long as you're able to get to a place where you're not anxious anymore and you can enjoy life, that's what it's all about. And I love the title of your book, You're Not Crazy. Because how many people like that are anxious are, like get offended like me about people saying, oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. What do you mean you have this feeling in your body? You're just crazy. Like I used to have like a thing where bugs used to crawl up and down like uh, my body. And I would feel like just like there was something crawling all over me. You could have, you know, I knew that there wasn't, but I could feel that there was. So, oh, you're crazy, Nellia. You're crazy. And there's nothing worse than really believing something in your mind and having people say this to you. So hurtful, you know, so if you're out so did there. You, did, you, did you think you were crazy? Did you start to believe that yes. because people were telling you that? Yeah, Absolutely. and that's what I mean about that. And that's exactly what I'm talking about when parents or other people start to divine, define an individual by their behavior. Like if you had, this has happened more than once, a child who throws tantrums, who's aggressive, and the family will say, he's just a little devil. And mm -hmm. I say, don't say that because now he's going to think that he is 
it's okay for me to do this. I'm a little devil. That's just an example, but it's kind of like when people tell you you're crazy, it's just going to feed into the little bugs that are crawling on you. Exactly. Exactly. So do you hear, like when people come and talk to you, do they talk to you about some of the things that people say to them that are hurtful, like things that people shouldn't say to people with anxiety? Like, what are some of the things that you should just not say? (laughs) (laughs) Well, yes, I think (laughs) I, if now you're talking about, if you are with a friend who's experiencing anxiety, what should you say or not say? Yeah. And the reason I'm asking is I'm sure there are people that come to you that explain, you know, when they, and you, they talk about their history and what it is, what kind of anxiety they have and, you know, how this is coming about. I'm sure they are feeling hurtful by things that people have said to them, because like you said, you do end up believing them, you know, so let's, let's do something positive for other people, right? Let's not. Well, I, I think one of them is, um, that I had an, uh, I have a young lady that I'm working with and she's doing fantastic, by the way. And nobody would have guessed that she was anxiety ridden, very outgoing and almost too outgoing because she was compensating. For, that's how she was dealing with her anxiety and, um, and also a skin picker. But when she told people that she had anxiety, they said, oh no, you don't, you're fine. Look at you, you're doing this, you're doing that. You don't have anxiety. So they didn't believe her. And so I think you shouldn't tell people Mm. how to feel, first of all. You can't tell somebody how to feel. And I I think it's best if somebody tells you that they're anxious about a situation, Mm. first of all, it takes a lot of guts and chutzpah for that person to come forward and say, I am experiencing anxiety because probably they've been experiencing it for a very long time. And for them to get up the nerve to talk to a friend about it, is another story, right? Okay. Uh, so my advice would be listen to the person and then say, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Mm. Yeah, that's great. And don't tell them, yeah, just what can I do for you? Tell me what I can do as a friend. Mm. Yeah, don't put labels on people. Just be open. No. I think that that's why it's important if you're listening to the episode and not only Perhaps you're the one that's struggling with anxiety, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're listening to this and you know somebody else. You know, hopefully that will help you a bit on what not to do, because now that you know how it affects people like Lori and I, then you might think twice about doing that, right? And then it it does help the person on their journey because they don't believe what you're telling them, which is great, right? If you don't believe you're crazy, you can move forward a bit quicker. (laughs) Yeah. And to know that, like I said, to normalize the situation, you're not alone. You're not crazy. This is happening Mm. to more people than you can imagine. They're just able to either, well, some of them have moved past it like you and I, and others are just able to hide it better. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, like anything else, I, I think that with my anxiety and panic attacks that I experienced, it would have come out eventually. You know, I mean, how much can you shove inside before you just explode, right? Yeah, and it's okay, you know? I think the more you hold it down, the more other things could happen. Like, people can become addicted to things. There's so many, you know, the self-harm, everything that you're saying, if you hold it in, you know, people are embarrassed to talk about it. Like, what's wrong with me? And then also a lot of the teens they will engage in risky behavior, meaning um, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be sex. I mean, just having, you know, sexual relations with a bunch of different people because they don't know what to do. And so they engage in this risky behavior. Yeah. So you said a lot of the times when people get diagnosed with anxiety, depression comes along with it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they have, you know, it's that vicious cycle of I'm depressed, I can't get out of bed, but I know I should be getting out of bed. I need to do this. I need to do that. So there's the anxiety part of it, but I'm so depressed I can't. So now I'm depressed, not only because I can't, I don't have the energy to get out of bed and do what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm depressed because of the anxiety. It, it just goes back and forth. Mm. 
What are some of the things like as parents, because I'm interested, I have a 15 year old who's been doing virtual for two oh. years. So he started, this pandemic started just before his grade eight graduation. So he missed that, missed his big trip, first overnight trip at the school, missed grade nine, oh. grade 10. So now he's halfway through grade 10. Um, and he's a great student, but he's starting to suffer in other ways. So it's just um, because I know a little bit about anxiety because of my own experiences, I, I hope that I can see some of the things, but I still feel like I might be missing stuff. What are some of the like red flags that parents can look out for um, with their kids, especially now with more kids being at home? Like in Canada, we just shut down again. So it's hard. I know. You guys have it tough over there. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, every every hour is different. You just don't know what to expect. Absolutely. Uh, we don't I would, know. It's I would. They know. No. Mm. No. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, I would say to really make sure that you have an open dialogue with your child, that you have a good relationship where you can talk about things. Also, if there's any way, I know that when we were on that strict lockdown, uh, that I was having. The, the younger people that I worked with, even in high school, to get like movie nights together where they would be on a Zoom session, but they'd mm -hmm. all be watching the same movie together. So it's not always just um, video games. Video games. <laughs> yes, video games. It's like, because that's a whole other, Ugh. that's a whole other thing. Um, but if you can get them where they're hooked up with friends uh, with some type of a, Zoom every Friday night, we're going to watch a movie. Everybody's going to take turns picking the movie. And then they do have some social groups. I don't know if his school does or outside of school where he can join via Zoom as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they do that in Canada. They do. It's just getting them wanting to do it because they're happy with doing well, thing, you know. Thank right. yes, My son is a, is a piano player. He's an amazing um, musician. Oh. And so he does that two, three hours a day, like, and you don't have to ask him. Wow. So he loves to do that. And it's great. And he likes to write and stuff, but it's all things that he does alone, you know? So it's it's alone. Just, yeah, he, he doesn't have a problem with it. He could go virtual till he's in, you know, out of university, but as a mother, <laughs> you know that right. this is not a good thing like people who are even like you said you had um you had a client who was going or a friend who was going from universe uh college and now they want to go in the workforce and what do they do um and i'm thinking these are future doctors future physicians future government you know people now that are you know starting their careers and what's good what what is the future going to look like if none of these people are prepared right and it's, so much anxiety yeah. it's it's scary to know where we're going to be in 10 years even so i love that we're having this conversation and i'm so happy that you're helping um you know to start all these conversations and helping people through their managing of the anxiety so so important i can't stress that enough because i know how it's positively managing positively has affected so many people in my circle that I so appreciate everything that you're doing. It's so important. What about your, I'm thinking about your son. Yes. <laughs> How can we help your son? What about a, what about some type of a music club that he can join on Zoom or even give lessons if possible? So at least he's connected yes. with another person. No, absolutely. He has started giving lessons for free. Um, and he loves that. He loves children. He loves connect. He's such a giver. Um, he loves doing stuff like that. I just feel like there could be more. So I think it's just more opening up the conversation and being like, okay, you know, how do you really feel? Do you feel like you're, you're um, separated from, from your group, you know, cause you do lose friends, you do lose things, um, connections with people, but yeah, that's a great idea. Definitely something to look into. And when he starts to socialize again, then there's that other part of the anxiety where each kid is going to feel they haven't been back to school for a while or they haven't, you know, engaged in a certain activity for a while. So a, a, a small amount of anxiety is okay. It's kind of the excitement part. It's yes. when it becomes debilitating that it's not good anymore. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm glad that your son is giving. Sorry. No, it's okay. I was just saying, I'm glad that your son's giving the lessons. I think that's a good way to go. 
Um, and then if he can continue that and join a music group or something. Something. It's just, I'm hoping he's going to go back, I think, in about a week. He seems to be fine. With, oh, good. I think I'm more concerned than he is. But it's just... Yeah, I just think, you know, so many, just listening to the kids talk and just even starting grade nine, for example, um, and not being able to go for grade nine, some of them starting this year in grade 10, some of his peers, they're like, oh, what's it going to be like in grade 10? You know, what's it going to be like? And, and I just said to them, you know, you know how many kids are feeling the same as you? Like there were more virtual than there were in school. Everybody's in the same boat. The whole world is suffering. It's not just it you is. feel like part of a bigger group, you know? Yeah. And honestly, I don't think we've even seen all of the anxiety that's going to hit us once we go back. Mm-hmm. So there's two parts of it. There's the people that say we need to still isolate in order to stay safe. We can't, we cannot let ourselves out. So once they see that people are starting to go out, then they're going to be anxiety ridden. And then we have the other ones that are feeling anxious because they want to go out. And how do you work with these two different sets of individuals? There has to be a way to get them to calm down and relax. They're going to have to, they're going to have to work through the anxiety on both sides of it. I think you're going to be busy for a while, Lori. Uh. (laughs) But it's just more people, you know, honestly. I was speaking to somebody the other day, and I don't know if you agree with this, or I'm curious. I was speaking to somebody and they were saying how there's so many more people in the world dealing with anxiety because of COVID and everything. And I find that the people who normally have anxiety, who suffer with this before the pandemic, um, a lot of the ones that I know are actually managing better than they thought through the pandemic. Uh, Maybe it's because they're used to Um, being kind of home, you know, if you have social anxiety, or maybe they're used to some of those things. I think it's the people, for me, I just, I'm looking around me and surrounding myself with these individuals. And it's almost like the people who have never had anxiety before are the ones that are struggling more now, because they don't have the skills in how to deal with, with what's happening. Do you agree with that? Or do you see it in a different way? I think it could be a combination. I think that the people that have had anxiety might be using the same strategies that they were, that helped them the first time to get through it. And so that's why they're doing okay now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also think it depends where they're at in their life. Like my friend who's in her mid to late sixties, it hasn't affected her life. You know, she's doing the same thing she was doing before the pandemic. So she's not anxious. She doesn't have a reason to be. And she doesn't associate herself. She doesn't see what's happening Mm. to everybody around her. She's not around school-age children. She's not around high school children. So she doesn't, hasn't affected her. Until I mention it, she's shocked. Mm. It's true because you're in your own routine, your own life, your own. And if you're not normal, if you don't normally have a schedule where you go out here or you go out there, it doesn't really like for me, I didn't stay home. I continued to work um, outside of the home. So for me, in that way, it didn't affect me at all. And thank goodness, because I think if I was home, I would have my anxiety might have been a little bit more escalated. So my routine tended to stay the same. But so many people were home and so many people were stuck in a world that they didn't recognize. You know. And, and, and some people don't want to go back to the office now. So there's that part of it. Yes. <laughs> I, and I never stopped. We, we never stopped working with people because we knew that, uh, especially the individuals we serve with developmental disabilities, everything shut down for them. Mm. And so if you have a developmental disability, you're living in a group home, right, with other individuals. You're used to going to a day program during the day where they have activities for you and fun things and go out on outings to make projects there. All of that was taken away. All of it was taken away. And so we were the only other source of um, social interaction that they had. And so we never stopped. It was very important um, to do that. But um, I had a thought again. (laughs) <laughs> perhaps they could do the um the activities <laughs> in the home you know they probably adjusted a little bit anyway 
just to get them, you know, something to look forward to. We all need that. Well, they did start the Zoom day programs where they would do that right. for an hour. Something. So they, they would drop off a booklet and write something where they would drop. Oh, I know where I was going with that. So they can't wait to go back. Now, I, I know a couple of other people that are accountants and that are secretary for accountants, or I don't even know if they're called secretaries anymore, office managers that were working from home for the since the very beginning of the pandemic. They don't want to go back. They're more productive actually at home and they're doing their job just fine. So mm. there's that part of it. Interesting, isn't it? It is. It's so, it's so many things because there's so many different types of, you know, anxiety. People usually think like I was mentioning earlier, the one person who's nervous and walking around, you just don't know. You know, I think there are more people no. suffering with it now than there have ever been for obvious reasons. And I think the more we learn about it and the more we have these types of conversations, um, the more things will change and improve. And, you know, it's like we were talking before we hit record too on having the skills before you actually need to use them and how important that is. Can you? Yes. So it's, yeah, so it's important. So when they, when individuals come to see me, I put a binder together that has a treatment plan in it. And they have to be accountable for practicing those skills when they're not having an anxious episode. Mm -hmm. Because what I was saying was that we can't expect to be able to use those tools unless we practice. And the analogy was if you sign up for a 10K or a 5K race and you don't train and you just show up on race day, how, you're not going to be able to run the 10K if you haven't been running at all. And it's like if you start to get a panic attack and you've been given tools, but you haven't practiced, you're not going to be able to utilize those tools. You're, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all the races too, like just your mindset, you know, and wanting to push beyond what you think is possible. I haven't run any of those and I'm not an athlete like you, but <laughs> I'm assuming you really have to put all your focus and determination in, into that, right? Yes. Yes, you do. And, um, and depending, you know, now I don't really race, I, I do still participate in runs, they just, they just started having them back again. And now who knows what's going to happen. But I was able to, you know, I just did a half marathon, I, I think it was in December. And um, I, in September, I backpacked some of the Appalachia Trail, I'm, I'm really into backpacking and hiking now as well. I think it it's fun. great. Uh, but it's mind over matter, especially the Appalachia Trail. That was um, the reason being is I'm not used to the weather over there in the, <laughs> you know, where it was North Carolina and Tennessee. It just pours and nothing dries. And um, so it was, it was, took a lot of getting used to. And I could have become very anxious because, you know, what am I going to do? My clothes aren't drying. It's, you know, oh. raining all the time. Uh, and then I passed a hiker and he said, how's it going? And I said, well, you know, and he goes, oh, your clothes aren't drying. And I said, no, nothing's dry. All this other stuff. He goes, you just got to embrace it. And I thought, you know what? He's right. I have to embrace it. Why am I fighting it? This is what I have to do. So then I was able to relax and enjoy it. But it's amazing. Some what things are, are harder. Yeah. What we set our mind to do, you know, it's just incredible. I've been interviewing amazing people like yourself and it's just the way that the thinking, like you were saying, the thoughts versus reality, how many times we have those thoughts that overcome, right? So when we have these positive thoughts and we can do it and, you know, just embrace it and how much it really impacts us. It's incredible. It's huge. It's huge. And, and a lot, when people come to see me, they don't realize that they are in control of that and they can do it. You know, you have the ability, you just have to believe in yourself mm -hmm. and, when the first time that it happens, once they tell me that, I say, now, from now on, I want you to go back to that time that you were able to change your thought and push through and actually enjoy something because it's going to happen more and more often if you allow yourself. Mm. I love that so much. Where can we find your book? <laughs> you can find my book. You can go to my website if you like, uh, you're not crazy book.com. And um, you can order it from there. It's also on Amazon. And I'm not sure if you have Barnes and Noble, but we do out here. It's a Barnes and Noble. 
You don't, okay. But I've got a lot of uh, and uh, then, worldwide listeners, so we're good. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then also um, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram as well. Uh, and you can email me directly from my website. I'll, I'll definitely answer you back. People have emailed me with questions and I, and I love answering them. Oh, that's fantastic. Is there anything we didn't talk about today that you wanted to mention before we go? Or is there anything we, that you, you wanted to talk about? Um, I just think that you are, you know, you're doing such a service to everybody out there by bringing attention to anxiety uh, I think it, it's not as there's not as much stigma around it now that more people are talking about it. And the more that you talk about it, the more you're able to ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's just huge. And it's I applaud you for doing that because you're helping a lot of people. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you so much. Yeah, I remember when I first was struggling with it, um, even before I thought I was, you know, early high school. It's going back, I think I've had it all my life and we didn't talk about it. It wasn't something no. you shared even with your mother. It wasn't something you shared with your friends. It wasn't until I was an adult and you said as well, and I must say, you look fantastic because oh. you, you didn't get diagnosed <laughs> until you were in your 50s. I'm like, what? Come on now. You don't even look <laughs> 50. So, <laughs> but it's, yeah, the conversations are there and they're being done and these teenagers are getting help and I just, I don't know. And I know that they will, the people who ha have been perhaps clients of yours will continue their life and continue to help other people too, because they know what it's like. Exactly. You're absolutely right. I mean, I've gotten more referrals from young individuals, like teenagers from word of mouth, because wow. this has been life changing for them. And so they share it with their friends. And um, it's really nice to have other individuals. This is what helped me. Maybe you should try it. I mean, how great is that? Yeah. And I find that the, the therapists that are the most helpful are the ones that have the same problem. You know, I just. We can, we can empathize. We yes. can empathize. Um, and I think that means something to the client. Well, when I was writing my book, I, the very last one of the very last things I did was write the introduction chapter, which is the first chapter. And I thought to myself, how much do I really want to tell about myself? Mm. And I thought, well, whoever reads the book is going to know, Hey, I, I went through this. So this is, this is how I experienced anxiety and this is how I came out of it. So come on in and join me. <laughs> I, I'm so happy you did that because if I had a choice and I had two people in front of me that I could work with and they were both, um, equally intelligent and equally, you know, have, have all the criteria behind them and all the certifications, I would choose the one that had been where I had been, you know, because I know that they, like you said, they can empathize and um, I would feel like I could trust that person a little bit more, you know, even if everything else was kind of level. That's just personally um, my, you know, my feeling. So I think it's good that you put that in so that people know hey, you can have anxiety and still become this. You can still help people. You know, it's not like you said who you are. It's a part of you. And the more you understand it, the less of a part of you becomes, right? Exactly. I love that so much. Can't wait to check out your book. <laughs> it was so great, <laughs> so great to meet with you and connect with you. And thanks again. Uh, I have fun with you. Oh, great. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, I always, I always learn something through these interviews and I always think, try to think of things in, in new ways. And, and so thank you for helping me do that. And thank you for helping the audience just know that, Hey, if I, I'm struggling with this, Lori's struggling with this, look around you. There's so many people these days. So it's okay. It's not, there's nothing wrong with you. And I think that's where we have to start because people feel like they're flawed and they're embarrassed and they're ashamed and you can't get to the next level and manage these things if you feel that bad about yourself. So you have to give to yourself first. I agree. I agree with you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe or leave a review. 
See you next week on the Giving Starts With You podcast.